right, welcome City of Rochester and full city community to another episode of the Equity Series. Um, it is Black History Month, so happy Black History Month to all of you. Also happens to be Valentine's Day, so extending love to all of you who've joined us on the call and to the community at large. Um, we're really excited to have you join us today. Our episode today is How We Rise, Lessons from Rochester's Black History. A little bit of background on the equity series itself. Um, our aspiration is to commit to co-creating healthier spaces in the Rochester community where everyone is able to participate equitably and to design spaces, places, and policies that include all people all the time. So that is the main aspiration. And we're excited to have all of you join us. We want you to know that the Equity Alliance is anchored by a couple of items. One is continuous improvement for all of us, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion action planning uh, by each and every organization that chooses to join the Alliance. We would like to have an economic impact, particularly to communities that have been left out of that space and transparently share all of the work that we're doing, which includes spaces like this one and radical collaboration. How do we work together in ways and in spaces that we haven't done in the past to ensure that as our community grows, all of the communities are able to grow. So for today, we have the great fortune of being joined by two really wonderful community members who have done a lot of the um, work in the space of curating history and telling stories um, that typically haven't been told in a lot of the spaces um, that we're in. So um, our first uh, person who is going to be joining us today is Andrew Crockett. Um, I have the bio app, I'll read a small portion of it, but not all of it. He has worked in the field of social work for about 17 years and is executive director of the Sports Mentorship Academy, as well as Barbershop Social Services. Um, if you know Andre, you know that he's in just about every space that you end up in. So we're really happy to welcome him here today. Um, we're also joined by um, Nicole Foyimhara, who is a wonderful writer, who is committed to liberation and healing through story and the power of language in the written word. Um, very many credentials, we'll not read them all and you can read them yourself but has been the wonderful curator of the How We Rise Black History exhibit, which tells the story of our local community um, and tells the story of Black voices. So we will welcome them both, but would like to remind you um, that the inaugural um, Black History Museum was here last week at the city of Rochester, has moved on to Rochester Community and Technical College, as well as the Rochester Area Foundation. So for those of you who didn't have a chance to view that, um, we hope that you're able to go into any of those two spaces between eight and five this week. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Nicole and Pastor Andre to share with us today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for inviting us to be here, Chow, and uh, Pastor Crockett and I are really excited to share some time with you all. I am going to pass it off here to Pastor Crockett to just get us started. He has been really the visionary for this uh, exhibit, um, and its its roots actually started several years ago with an exhibit that was hosted at uh, the History Center of Olmstead County. So um, just as a way of introduction, I'd love Pastor Crockett to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, thanks for having us again. I just want to give you a little history and background how this all started. Um, in 2021, I approached um, the History Center uh, about um, how do we keep Black history in the forefront of our community. And um, after a couple of months of that dialogue and talking about it, um, we came together um, and we formed um, a Black History Museum in 2021. We brought along um, notable voices such as George Thompson, Sandra Means, and the rest of them. We got them together and asked them, um, how could we celebrate the accomplishments and the struggles that they went through? And um, they helped us form what you see in the History Center. And that was in 2021 again, that three years later, it's still there. So it tells me that our community, um, this was something they was interested in and how do we get it to the broader community? And that's when I passed over to Nicole, how we brought it to the broader community outside of the four walls of the History Center. 
Yeah, we really had a vision to make sure that it was accessible to as many people as possible. And so the form that it's in now with the banner ups and traveling through different places is really what we wanted it to do. And we wanted to launch it in Black History Month and also for it to have a life well long after Black History Month so that it could continue to move through the community, can continue to inspire different types of conversation. As the curator and the designer for the exhibit, I worked with Dr. with Pastor Crockett to pull the information and the archives from um, the previous History Center exhibit. That that exhibit specifically focused on the 1960s and the 1970s, and it had a lot of oral histories from many of the elders that are still in the community today. And I also pulled some information from previous research I had done by a community um, from community historians and journalists in our community, and then also just pulling through things like newspaper archives and footnotes and things like the Negro's Home in Minnesota, which uh, was published in the 1940s, and it was actually a report commissioned by the governor's um, interracial commission, I think, at the time. And it had a little blurb about Rochester. And so it was sort of pulling on these threads as, in terms of building some of the history before the 1960s um, in this community as well. With a place like Rochester, the history, I think, is is sometimes not on the surface level. And you have to dig and ask questions and be critical, um, talk to the elders um, who are still here. And so this project is also one that was about preservation of building a foundation for the history being made um, today, the history that has been made previously. and then. So I think Pastor Crockett and I would talked about this a little bit, this idea that 20 years down the line, we don't want anyone saying, where is Rochester's Black history or there's no Black <laughs> history here. Um, I will tell you now that there are very few spaces in this country that have not been shaped or impacted in some way, big or small, by Black individuals and communities. And so it's sort of a call for all of us to just question wherever we are. And you don't see, if you don't see the Black history, it doesn't mean it's not there. And to be critical minded around, around that. Um, I think another big part of this exhibit, the expansion of it, um, was um, at the end uh, when you sort of travel through it chronologically. And we talk a little bit about the current leadership um, and issues facing the Black community today, but some of the just issues of civil rights and social justice um, that the community has um, had to navigate and be be leaders in, in terms of moving things forward. And Pastor Crockett, of course, is one of the leaders in the community um, really helped in sort of shaping what that looks like and um, thinking about who are the leaders and the, the stories that we need to make sure that we're preserving now, even if it's just been in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. And the list of figures that are in the exhibit are not exhaustive. And I think from the beginning, this was about it being a living archive, a growing archive, something that's more of an invitation for us to go deeper. I think anytime you take on a community exhibit, something as big as the history of a community, you are going, it's going to be incomplete. It's always going to be in a state of becoming. And so I think that's for anyone in an organization or another space that's thinking about putting together a history or digging into the history, I think that's something that you need to leave room for. And so this exhibit has room for that. It sort of has sort of this generous, sort of abundant, flexible nature um, that we hope will continue to grow over time. Sorry, here, oops. Pastor Crockett, do you want to talk a little bit about why our history matters? Yeah, um, that's very important. Um, as I stated before and did plenty of interviews, I talked about how I've been here um, 30 years and I'm um, doing this project um, that a lot of these individuals I didn't even um, I know of. So it was like um, invisible history to me. And one of the talk shows I did a couple of years ago um, talked about black should black history be taught in school. Um, and I realized that very few schools really hit on black history, especially locally. And so um, for me, I felt like a teenager all over again of rediscovering um, history, uh, especially history here in Rochester. So that really had a profound impact like on, on my life. And so I wanted to continue that to for especially for younger kids um to show that we did have you know school teachers and social workers and other individuals that um uh, went before us um and so this is why it's so important i think that we preserve it and we continue to talk about it and have it in many places as possible i think that empowerment piece is a really important one and just thinking about 
the things that we get to be a part of, you know, that to know that there's some roots to to where we are in this place. Um, there's so many issues going on in our community and in our world today, for sure. Um, and I, I have this quote here um, from James Baldwin about why history matters. And it really is because we carry our histories with us. So we're living in the present, we're sort of moving toward the future, but we carry those histories with us. And when you grow up in a community or a community becomes home to you, that history becomes part of what you carry in a lot of senses. And it it has an impact. So be it the racial covenants and redlining that make it so that home ownership today looks a certain way or our neighborhoods, um, you know, your neighborhood is looks different compared to other neighborhoods, right? Like that's a real sort of through line of a history and the impact that it has today, whether it's the fact that there were early Black leaders who paved the way for the equity and justice work that we're doing now. Those are shoulders that we now stand on, right? And so being aware of that is really really, really important. I think in a place like Rochester, centering the histories of Black, Indigenous people of color also means that we could combat this pervasive myth of local and regional um, homogeneity. And by, what I mean by that mm -hmm. is this idea that um, this is a white city or a white state um, that somehow, and it is a stereotype, you know, we're we're all Scandinavian Lutherans with a penchant for casseroles, right? It, and, and that stereotype doesn't serve any of us. Um, it doesn't serve the communities that we've built, um, the cities and the towns that we live in. And so um, it ends up erasing the histories, the current realities, and things like the tribal sovereignty of Native American communities um, whose land we the city is built on, as well as the impact that different communities, immigrants, refugees, people of color have had in our communities. And so when we start to think about and pull on those threads of the history and start thinking about it in a sort of a wider scope of what does Rochester history look like? What is the diversity that has kind of, in a way, always been here look like? It starts to um, combat this myth. And that myth also often, I think, prevents us from, it kind of becomes an excuse sort of thinking around, you know, oh, well, diversity is a new thing. It's something that just happened in the community. And so instead of thinking about, well, actually there have been these communities here and some of these issues are still persistent. So how do we tackle the systemic inequality? And so projects like this, while focused on history, really are about what we go, what are we going to do with that history? in a lot of ways. And just like Pastor Crockett was saying, when we don't have that history, there's sort of this loss of a collective and institutional memory. You start, you know, if we don't ask ourselves about our our histories and in and, and our different communities, we don't know who we are. And if we don't know who we are, then we don't know where we're going and what we're becoming as a city and as a community. And so this is a really restorative project to sort of say, this is also part of our history. And now that's also part of who we are and who we are continuing to move forward. This, this keeps going forward instead, backwards. And forward. <laughs> Back. There we go. <laughs> All right, Pastor Crockett, making a way. How did we make a way out of no way? Yes, that's what we say. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, we 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 making a way. I think that you you said it that how we stand on the shoulders of those who uh, paved the way for us, and now that we they open the door so we can be able to do projects. You know, you know such such as this, and uh, making a way. You you, you point. And your and your PowerPoint shows that local black social clubs, and I found that's very interesting. That you know they had clubs. That's the Ebony, the Ebony, Ebony Sisters, um, the tri you know the trendsetters. And so when they did come came here, that they um, I had a place that they could have a sense of um a of a belonging. Um, and the first newspaper, you know, we I I didn't uh discovered that they had a um a news a newspaper and only had a newspaper they have a calendar and so uh i just recently uh george thompson gave me um their one of their old calendars that they had you know back in the day so they can have um no one events and current events and things that you know that's happening and so some of the things that we thought that we are doing today we thought was the first we actually not they um they have been doing this back in you know since the 60s and the 70s Definitely. I think that was one of my favorite parts of the exhibit was um, learning about the social clubs, learning about the black newspapers. And I just loved visually. I felt a sense of belonging just looking at the photos and putting those photos together of, you know, the family raking the leaves here in Southeast, which is my neighborhood. <laughs> and, you know, people, you know, a family uh, in the 1970s at the fairgrounds for the 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 state fair or the, the county fair, 
you know, things like that, people fishing. Like it was just, it was so beautiful to just see sort of everyday life, black life really in this community at a time where people don't often think that there were um, black families and communities here. And like Pastor Crockett said, many of the first black families that arrived in Rochester really did build a life here. They started the social clubs and the black newspaper. And Joyce Gibbs, one of our beloved community members who's been here for I think over 63 years now, um, she's pictured in the middle picture um, with her family. And I, last week at the um, city council or at the city's uh, launch of the exhibition, she talked about how when she came to Rochester, she was real excited. You know, she knew that the Mayo Clinic was here, that, um, you know, that she was like, there. Were, you know, I knew there were going to be smart people here. Um, and she arrived and um, she still faced discrimination in our schools um, and in, in terms of finding housing for her and her family. And she was just trying to live her life as a member of this community with her family and still had to come up against these things. And her husband, George Gibbs, who many of us know as uh, one of the, the first Black men actually to step foot in Antarctica, but also the founder of the Rochester chapter of the NAACP and a prominent, he became a prominent civil rights leader here in the community while Mrs. Gibbs served in the schools and different community organizations that her children were a part of. And we see the Gibbs family's legacy continuing in our community. And the Gibbs are perhaps the most well-known, um, but there were several other sort of founding families, the Mendenhalls, the Trotters, the Means, the Richardsons, the Thompsons, and a lot of others. But this legacy of leadership and wake, making a way out of no way, I think in a way is double-edged. And doctor, uh, I keep calling you doctor, the great Dr. Crockett, <laughs> <laughs> that gravity, Pastor Crockett, um, Pastor Crockett, when we were, you know, we'd have these chats as we were building the exhibit, you know, I'd go meet him over at this um, Sports Mentorship Academy. And, you know, in talking about the history, we were always talking about sort of the current situation now. And one of the things that came up for us a few times was around how there is this sort of double edged sword around the legacy of leadership. We need to honor and we need to celebrate, but we also need to acknowledge the burden on a family like the Gibbs trying to mm -hmm. live their lives and raise a family in a new community with the very few people who look like them. Um, and now they need spaces to, they need to create spaces, they need to lead efforts just to feel safe and to have a sense of belonging. And unfortunately, I think that story is no different. Over 60 years later, people of color in this community are still overwhelmingly burdened with having to create spaces and lead efforts and take up sort of the cause around um, how to how to find community and how to feel safe and how to do the equity and justice work that's necessary in our community. So one of the questions that we have, I think, for all of you, and you know, it's a question that Pastor Cockett and I discussed quite often was, how do we support this labor? How do we honor this labor? How do we make sure that these individuals and organizations have the accomplices and the resources that they need, um, as well as the time and the space to rest and reset and be in community? Um, I think people of color do not preternaturally have an ability to make change and do equity work, but they've had to do it. You know, We've had to do it. We've had to make it happen. And often that work happens on the margins. So even now, after sort of the flurry of a lot of equity roles and a lot of equity work nationally um, across institutions, we're actually seeing that those are some of the first, you know, work and roles that are being cut when there are budget constraints, right? So that's something to think about. Um, how do we support this labor? It is actual work. And, you know, in our community, a lot of that work has you know, in in historically not been paid work. It hasn't been work that has been sort of uplifted and honored in the same way. And it has happened on that margins. So it's really important. I think it matters a great deal. Additionally, I think there's also a trend um, that we saw as we were thinking about the, the leadership that we have now, sort of the BIPOC leaders that we have in our community, where people of color are being invited to the table, but not at often high levels, right? And not at often decision-making levels. And so how do we think about, um, how do we think about that dynamic and how do we think about seeding power in different ways? So those are more questions. I know we said we were going to give you some lessons. These are more questions. I think <laughs> that the exhibit really does sort of, um, you know, I think in a very sort of open way, um, start to kind of get at and tease at as you sort of think about the whole kind of um, span of the history and of the things that um, had to be established. And sometimes it does feel like um there's been sort of this trend of having to recreate things or having to be burdened in terms of having to um, cultivate spaces in different ways. Do you have anything else to add, Pastor Crockett, before we move on? No, that was that was great. Okay. Great. All right. The Avalon, Pastor Crockett. Oh, everybody know about Avalon. You know, <laughs> but uh, as you've seen it in the Green Book, and I think History Center did it. 
and um it was it was created out of because of the um inequities and injustice because the family wasn't able to stay you know at the May, at the Mayo Clinic and again they had to they have to create that create that space um themselves again so when other patients um, come to Mayo Clinic have a place to stay or if as an individual just traveling through had a um uh I have a have a place to stay but it was more of a, a safe haven for African Americans back in um in the in those in those days. Yeah, I um I often think about what it would have been like to go to the Avalon. Um I think there's you know I think a lot of us know about this history um and we you know, it's been highlighted in different ways, but I, I do wonder about that sort of having this physical building. It was a restaurant. It was a hotel. Um, it saw a lot. It saw a lot of traffic of people that were traveling here. I think that um, that sort of identity Rochester has as a crossroads of people coming in and out, um, people traveling, notable figures, of course, coming in um, primarily to get care um, and what it meant for this to be a place of belonging for for those people. I mean, we've got some notable people, Duke Ellington, Nat King Cole, Henry Armstrong, but also other folks um, in some of the stories about the early Black medical professionals that came to Rochester when they interviewed, often many of them stayed at the Avalon Hotel, right? That that means something, that says something. Um, in, the, in the 1960s and 70s, it was still a um, a, a safe space um, in, in that sense. I think in terms of talking about the Avalon, and you'll see this trend through each slide, we need to hold two things. Um, one is to celebrate that there was this historic Black business housed in a building that is still standing today, which is no small feat for a historic old building. And also needing to acknowledge, as, Dr. as Pastor Crockett said, the racist and the segregationist policies and practices, however formal or informal, that were in operation in the city's early history that made it so that the Mannings had to create this space, right? The Mannings founded the Avalon Hotel as a direct result of these practices that kept them shut out. And then their inclusion in the Green Book and the History Center um, had a, a lovely Traveling traveling While Black exhibit a few years ago um, that Pastor Crockett mentioned. And if you don't know about the Green Book, um, it really... It really meant that it was one of the only safe spaces for Black people to travel in all of Southeast Minnesota. The, the Green Book was not a vacation guide. It was actually a guide to safety. And so um, the Green Book was started because Black individuals and families were being violently assaulted or attacked, sometimes killed or lynched while they were traveling across this country in predominantly white towns. So the fact that we had a building, a business, um, a space here in this community that kept people that were traveling safe is is very critical, I think. And the ability to just sit with that for a minute, I think is really important. I think sometimes we sort of fly by that history. Well, there was this hotel and, you know, it welcomed Black, uh, black travelers and then it was included in the Green Book. The inclusion in the Green Book happened two years after it was founded in 1948. And it remained in, I mean, it remained in the Green Book, and I think until it, would, it went out of print, um, but it was the only place until the early 1960s in this region of Minnesota that um, that was listed there. And later on, it expanded to include, I think, Deluxe Cabins, Samaritan, Gatewood, and the, w, uh, the YWCA here in Rochester. Many of those, actually, those buildings um, and those businesses were actually on in the southeast side of Rochester, too, um, a place that we know had also sort of been impacted by redlining and some other prop practices and policies in the community um, pretty early on in our history. And so I think it's really important to think about also the Mannings had um, had clearly had financial resources. They were able to see a problem um, and they were able to find see a gap and say, we're going to we're going to solve that pretty quickly because they were able to buy a building. I often think about um, who else would have sold them a building, sold them property in 1946? The Sternbergs, who they bought the property from, were actually um, a Jewish family who had started their own hotel and um, deli, I believe, in response to discriminatory practices against Jewish community members. So had the Sternbergs not had that connection, had not had that shared sort of mission around their own hotel, there is that question of whether whether the Avalon would have actually existed. The the Mannings were not from here. They were from the West Coast. Um, they did not know anyone here. They could have left and sought care elsewhere, but they decided to stay. And so I have a lot of questions about that history, but also a lot of gratitude for sort of the risks that were taken um, and the partnership. I think I, I do see the Sternberg and the Mannings as, as sort of a partnership, sort of this passing on of a legacy around what it means to create refuge and safety in a community um, that may 
that is not um, entirely so. And in terms of today's history, that sort of question around um, how do we support today's Black-owned businesses? Uh, again, the Mannings had the financial resources. Today, that's very difficult. It is very difficult for anyone, really, to purchase commercial property, to rent um, anything for a business that they might be trying to start. And one of the beautiful things about Rochester, I've been here for about 10 years now, which is like, I'm like a baby in terms of time here, but it is my home and I built a life here. Um, one of the things, though, that I think um, Pastor Crockett and I agree on is that there is something about Rochester that makes it, I think it's its size primarily, makes it a very nimble and flexible place to be able to try different models, to be able to try different things around how to create spaces or support different communities. And so when we're thinking about how to support today's Black-owned businesses, you know, are there different models, cooperative economic models? How do we support Black self-determination? Things like that that can allow, um, you know, yeah, can allow a little bit more uh, innovation in how we think about who gets to take up space in our communities, who gets to have businesses in our communities and physical um, physical establishments. A lot of our Black entrepreneurs and businesses are remote online kind of functioning or functioning sort of in a home space as opposed to um, in our commercial businesses, our commercial spaces. And so those are questions to ask ourselves. Um, I'm very attached to this history of the Avalon. I think it signals some really beautiful things for what is possible, what was possible, and what is definitely should be even more possible um, uh, today. Anything else to add before we move on, Pastor Crockett? No, and then, yeah, just if we can get, you know, uh, really support the Black-owned businesses. The Black-owned business that you did talk about, the Avalon, you know, they had barbershops and different things, you know, back then, but they no longer exist now. So how do we uh, keep keep that um, legacy alive that we can keep um, those businesses thriving within our community? There we go. Um, I think one of the most interesting things for me, I think especially as someone who had previously worked at Mayo Clinic, was digging a little deeper into the early Black uh, medical professionals who trained and worked here. Uh, Rochester Local did a really lovely piece last year that I think outlines uh, a lot of this history. Um, I was able to contact the USS Hope, which um, gave us this photo for the exhibit, which is at the top here, Viv Vivian Whitehead, she, Whitefield, White. Whitefield, I believe her name was. Um, she was um, the first physical Black physical therapist here in Rochester in the late 1950s. And this is a photo of her actually. Um, after she trained here, um, she went on to this uh, floating hospital that traveled through Peru and served different communities um, in Latin America. And then she came back to Mayo Clinic for a little while as well. Um, I had never heard about her. And so I had heard about some of the Black physicians, but there was something about finding out about some of these other healthcare professionals that were um, non-physician medical professionals, and particularly women. Um, I think some it was a little hard to find um, in terms of our local Black history, um, a lot of mentions of women specifically, actually. And so it was, I was just, I really enjoyed kind of finding out a little bit more about that. Um, but many of the early Black medical professionals um, that were that trained here and joined the staff, um, many of them didn't stay. And so you're going to see this recurring theme around <laughs> sustainability and who stays and who goes and why. Um, for Pastor Crockett and I, this seemed to reinforce another issue that we also talked a lot about as we were planning this exhibit. Um, that's, I guess, for lack of a better word, sort of a brain drain. I think its official term is a human capital flight, which mm -hmm. is this idea that um, we have people that um, are trained here, come here for work for different reasons. Um, you know, a lot of those founding families in the 1960s and 1970s, they came here for work, right? Um, but then they don't end up staying or they don't end up staying for um, the, the next generation. And so a lot of the children and descendants of those early founding families we mentioned before didn't end up staying here in Rochester for a number of different reasons. Uh, we talk about today's Black youth and young adults. Why are they not considering staying or coming back here to Rochester, even though they grew up here? And of course, we live in a world um, where it's common to leave your hometown. I'm from New York. I no longer live there, much to my parents' uh, chagrin. Um, but uh, there is a question, I think, here for us to ask ourselves around 
belonging and around the types of spaces that are being created or not created um, within organizations and, and, and spaces, you know, like the Mayo Clinic, and we'll talk about IBM a little bit later on, um, and other organizations where people come to work or train, and then they may not see themselves in the actual community. I think sometimes we think about, um, we talk a lot about recruitment, and of course, everyone here also knows the importance of retention for organizations and um, businesses, you know, that does look a certain way. And for me, I've always been interested in the community question around how does a community do retention, right? Because it's not just about the experiences and the sense of belonging you may be cultivating within your workplace, but also in the community. So if I leave the walls of my workplace and I'm not able to live my life in a way that feels safe, I can't even get my hair done. I can't enjoy some, you know, I can't taste some food that is familiar, not familiar, but it's, you know, that that feels a little bit like home to me. You know, those are, those are, Chow gave me this term earlier, sort of passive markers of belonging, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I often think about that. You know, we, we had some very illustrious people move through here um, who were trained here and were actually, like I said before, offered staff positions. Um, I think Dr. Um, Clark, um, who's pictured in the middle right there, um, he he was a resident and then he was offered a uh, a full time consultant position and he didn't he stayed for like six months and then left. Um, and then there was a, a female obstetrician who left um, as well shortly after being offered a consultant position to go to Chicago and work at um, Cook County Hospital. Um, so these are just questions that I have as we're sort of thinking about, you know, we know that we are the med city. We know that that is a, a one of the biggest ways that, you know, different people come here for different reasons. Um, it's not the only way, but it is a large way. Um, and so that's always a question for me around what does that look like? What does radical belonging look like both within our workplaces and in our community? How do those things come together? How do we work together to support that for the people that are deciding to um, take a chance and come here to work or to get an education? So um, if you do see the exhibit or if you've seen it already, um, this is a really interesting panel. Um, and I, I, I didn't know um, until I started doing some of the research about many of these people. Um, and down there on the lower um, right um, is Dr. Bernard, Bernard Harris, who was actually the first black man to do a spacewalk um, in our history. And he became a NASA astronaut, um, but he was a physician first who trained here at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Uh, Dr. Crockett. Pastor Crockett. That's, that's good. You did a good job. We go to the next slide. You did a All good right. job. Wonderful. We get enough chance to ask questions. <laughs> yes. All right. This is all you. Yes. Yes. So this. Uh, so yes, this is the IBM. And so just as uh, Miss Nicole was talking about earlier about uh, uh, some of the cultural things or some cultural norms that we tend to look for, I think IBM did a good job when they recruited. Um, black and brown individuals from different states and different places. Not only that though, I'm talking to George and the rest of them, they actually had a black recruiter going to historical black colleges and stuff talking about, and, this, and that's what representation matters at, right? Having someone look like them, recruit them and bring them here. But they understood that in order for it to keep them here, there's other things they had to do outside of work um, to make them feel like a sense of belonging. And uh, we don't have all the pictures here, but she has some on there. You can see George and some other colleagues and stuff. They had, they formed their own um, football team. You know, they had their own flag football team, their own basketball team, soccer, um, bowling leagues, uh, chess. Um, they, they had uh, um, uh, social activities, life outside of, of work that was very, I think, very important, um, you know, to them. And you look at you look at them from the 60s to the 80s. A lot of them did stay. Not that kids so much, but a, a lot of them did stay. And today we look at it, and when we saw talking to um, the uh, black community when they get recruited to come here, whether to schools, Mayo, wherever it, wherever it may be, they have an exit plan. They always said, you know, I'm here three to four, you three to four, you know, three to four years. And partly because some of the things that where they come from, they come here, it's not available to them. And so you end up had to go, you know, hour and a half, hour, 40 minutes to Minneapolis to be able to get some of those um, ex experiences. And so in order for us to retain and retention of, you know, your employees and stuff like that, you got to have um, um, things outside of the workplaces um, for them to be able to um, feel comfortable with and to be in those spaces. Thank you, Professor Kaka. We have a couple more slides here, but they're, I think they're more, um, 
I think we could probably just pause here and start our discussion um, because it's just more about like, where do we go from here? Um, the only other note I think I wanted to to make before we we open up for questions is just that this is a sort of, you know, this Black history exhibit. And of course, we know that Black is not a monolith. And so one of the important things that we wanted to make sure was in the exhibit was also um, opening up the space to also really sort of understand and center what it means to have a diverse Black community in this city. Um, the, the city... The city is unique, as is Minnesota, in that we have a lot of diversity within the Black community that's made up of um, different people from uh, from across the United States, as well as refugees and immigrants. Um, we also have a very large number of multiracial Black people, as well as transracially adopted Black people. So transracially adopted Black people are people who are um, identify as Black, um, but who are being raised by non-Black family. Mm -hmm. and so the Minnesota specifically has quite a long history of transracial adoption. Um, and it we see it in our community, we see it in our state. And so when we think about when we think about our history, when we think about the issues that are facing us today, I think another thing to think about as you're thinking about that for this community, thinking about that for your organizations or, you know, just whatever, is to always be thinking about um, the diversity within, to be asking questions around how to disaggregate data so that we are understanding all the different facets of the Black community. Um, I didn't, sorry, I didn't advance the slide because it's right here. Um, the different facets of the Black community and what those issues are to tell different stories about that. Um, is really important. And so um, we we had, you know, like I said before, you know, 14 panels of things and things that could really be expanded upon in a lot of different ways. And so that's also an invitation to be thinking about what does our diasporic legacy look like within our different communities, Black communities here in Rochester as well. And then where do we go from here, Pastor Crockett? That's the question what? for everyone. <laughs> That's that's the, I think that's a question for everyone on here. You know, where where do we go over here? Where do we go with the information that that we're presented to us? And uh, well, no, we don't want to just isolate this just to Black history. We uh, we want to make sure that everybody know this is history. Not only is it history, but history in the making. That we're not only highlighting those who showed us we stand on those who now who are actually doing the work. And I think what you showed right there are some of those things that we see some of the kids social justice groups um, inside the schools now. Kids are taking, you know, taking the lead. And we know from civil rights that most of them who led these marches and uh, stuff was young kids. It was young, it was young kids themselves, um, you know, uh, participating in the, whether the bus boycott or the restaurants in the schools. It was these young individuals that catapult and, and got things, you know, got things started. And so we want to continue and we need your help um, to be able to um, make it that much easier for a, another young person to feel comfortable and a sense of belonging and create those um, safe spaces that they need to be able to thrive within schools, within the communities. So we, we, we need, that's what we, we need to go. We need to, we need to do that. And um, we need your help to be able to, you know, to get it done. Thank you so much, Pastor Crockett and Nicole. Um, you know, as you're talking through the slides, I literally could envision kind of moving through those spaces in time and some of the experiences, even if, uh, of course, none of us were present. So I'd just like to open um, an invitation to everyone who's on the call. If you have a reflection um, or if you have a question to feel free to unmute yourself and share that, or um, you could utilize the chat to do that. So. I will give the awkward pause to allow for people to, to reflect. Okay, can I, I'll start a little bit here. Thank you. And I'm, I'm always inspired by, by the history of uh, the African-American experience uh, in the United States, as well as of course, particularly in Rochester too. And then as Chinese immigrant, Asian, you know, my friend said, who owns the Wong's Cafe and Dunn Brothers, they're long-term residents of, of Rochester. So they experience a similar kind of a history in terms of where they can even live when uh, they when they first came to the came to Rochester. There are certain places that they couldn't really, uh, they've been advised that they could go go there. So the 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 covenants issue is even broader than what the uh, uh, black people experience. It is actually all people of color have that experience. 
So I guess what I'm saying is that maybe I'm looking for a, a way to uh, leverage the the story that from uh, from the African American experience. How do we include a broader story about other people of color that have gone through uh, the same kind of experience in, a, in, in my own, own way of uh, uh, in, in the United States? As recently as 19, before 1952, there's a thing about Chinese Exclusion Act, meaning that as Chinese people, you couldn't immigrate to the United States, right? So there's this history uh, that uh, we could somehow can tell together in the hope that, uh, that we made it progress, obviously, in the hope that we can look forward to the future. How do we make a country that is really live up to the uh, the spirit of uh, making a more perfect union? But, so that is what I'm kind of maybe entertaining some conversation. As you know, I'm involved with several uh, community engagement, and particularly the coalition of BIPOC people, so that we can combine our voices to learn from each other's story, and also to to tell a cohesive story about what we can look forward to as a nation, as the the kind of America and the kind of world that we really want to create. So I'm looking for some, you know, synergy, some collaboration, and I like to, you know, connect more with our group. Obviously, we want to connect with the various initiatives in town. So we want to kind of pursue that 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 uh, the journey. I'll stop at that time. Thank you for that, Al. And I, I think Pastor Crockett and I can agree. I think we said it on last Monday too at the launch. We we want this to inspire more exhibits like this, more storytelling around um, what this has looked like for all the different communities within our 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 city. And so this is just an, it's an invitation, and I think some exciting, wonderful things to come. So I'm always happy to to collaborate uh, with you, Al. And I yeah, it, I think it's something that's critically important. Um, there are a couple of comments, reflections in the chat. Um, Randy did ask where we can go see or folks can go view the exhibit. And I mentioned Rochester Community Technical College as well as the Rochester Area Foundation. But I would invite Andrea or Nicole if you want to expand on that and talk about the future of the exhibit a little bit. Yeah, so you, yeah, so uh, we're going to, it's also going to be at after this week at UMR. Um, and then it's going to also be. Following week, going to be at Rochester uh, Rochester Public Schools uh, for two weeks, and then after that, it'll be at um, the airport. So we're still looking for uh, um, other people who want to house through um, the exhibit. I think we had a couple of churches who want to do it too, but we we uh, we want it in many many places that we can um, get it at. And if you want us to come and do presentations and stuff like that, we are um, definitely definitely open. Um, there is also a reflection um, from a Kay Edson, um, who says, I'm very grateful to those who created this awesome exhibit. I appreciate the opportunity to learn um, and how to create a welcoming community. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that reflection. Um, any other thoughts or questions from anyone? I see John, you unmuted. Yeah, I would just say a special thanks to uh, Natalie Victoria and uh, her company. They have acquired um, the Avalon. And I've seen some of their uh, plans for the future and they're gonna um, retain the integrity of that building and uh, with an eye toward its history, which is pretty cool to hear. Uh, secondly, and perhaps more importantly, that, uh, and Andre's well aware of this, we are continuing to develop new tools, Nicole, as we look at business startup, particularly in the entrepreneurial space whether that be property acquisition, whether that be training, whether that be financing, getting people ready to finance, credit scores, that whole myriad of services we're absolutely committed, um, and certainly the city is as well, to providing additional economic development related services for all people. And uh, we're uh, always aligning new tools to make that happen, but, and we can always do more and we can always do better. But um, I have a team of really committed people that uh, are absolutely convinced that that is a direction we should be going. And of course, uh, the board and, and I 
certainly support that work. So a lot of good things happening also. And as Andre and I would agree, we can always do more and we should do more, but we are trying to pull out every possible service we can to help all people uh, grow in this economy. Thank you. I do see a couple of people unmuted, so please feel free to hop on um, if you have a question or reflection. Maybe one more comment is that uh, from within the CMRC group, you know, community mobilization group, which you got uh, consists of various BIPOC groups, there is there was some uh, some initiative that was started by the Ethiopian group wanted to uh, maybe connect with the History Center to also tell their story in terms of, uh, in fact, in general, the immigrant contribution to Rochester. So that, so this reminds me, you know, that uh, we need to continue to kind of start, follow up with that work with uh, Olmstead County History Center about telling that story about immigrant contribution to Rochester. This is another comment about how we get inspired by by the, uh, you, the your story, you know, that you're telling here. Just really want to get us moving to pursue that particular uh, that, that particular idea. Um, and as folks are thinking about um, questions or reflections that I have, there was something that you mentioned, Nicole, that kind of struck a chord with me. Um, when you talked about the idea of history not just being in the past, right, it being really tangible and present, um, and that's something you often encounter, you know, when 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 I've at least referenced things in the past, and responses that I get um, would be, well, that was so long ago, right? Well, that's in the past. Why can't we move forward? So just wondering how you you or Andre respond or would respond um, to to that type of reflection. I mean, I think as we still see um, some of the struggles with which um, I see they struggles in the you know sixties and um, and seventies, especially you, you especially when we talk about supporting um, black led organ, organizations, you know those, those things that we still struggle with seeing um, uh, the resources that's necessary to keep them um, you know sustainable. You talk about red light, you know red light, I think that. The city just passed the, you know, um, things to, you know, combat that, you know. Um, so we still, we're still facing some of that, right? We still see um, a school district getting better, but still not having um, black school teachers, right? I think back then, you know, they had very, very few black school teachers, and we still have very few um, black um, school teachers. But um, what you think, um, Nico? Oh, I, I agree, and I think for my part, I'm always. I'm always trying to figure out new ways to like articulate that that thread. I think, um, you know, things like the what is redlining and racial covenants mean to me when I'm buying a house to like, you know, to anyone buying a house or a community that they're living in. Sometimes sometimes it is hard to kind of um, talk, say that in a, in a one sentence in a line to kind of talk about that. But I think as much as we can kind of figure out how to communicate um, the living impacts of those types of histories are really important and just tell those stories. I think it is really powerful. I mean, I remember Chow, um, one of our first times together, you talking about your own issues with housing or, you know, then listening to someone like Joyce Gibbs talk about that, right? Those are stories. And again, this idea of storytelling, different ways to tell those stories that kind of make the data and the things that are on the paper, um, you know, or in the history book more tangible um, that those are lived things um, and and have impacts you know where you live actually does matter and so um, and where you you know what you have access to so I guess that would be my my response to that as well I do see there's a couple of questions here in the chat about oh will the exhibit have a permanent location um, after it's been hosted and <laughs> we would love for it to have a permanent location. Uh, I do like the idea of of it of us always having sort of like a pop up ability where there's you know if, if it does have a home that there's also an opportunity for it to pop up in different places. And like I said, so many opportunities for just one of those panels to be like taken out and sort of you know grown into different other types of programming or other things because there's so many different things within that the exhibit. 
Uh, and then the digital part of it as well, Pastor Crockett and I have been talking about having a website. One of the things that we also notice is that a lot of our community elders are elderly. And what does it mean to make sure that their voices and their stories about what it was like to work and live here um, when they came and to build this life and to do the leadership they did, um, how do we make, do an oral history of that and archive that um, in a meaningful way? So I think that's sort of the next vision for what this can can look like. Um, and I am again excited about opportunities to uh, think about other communities and how um, how to grow that story in different ways as well. Yeah, and so, yeah, we, we want to have a private home because we got some of the artifacts and stuff that's going to be coming. I think that we can do something similar how um, Spunk started off, right? Uh, partner with um, the Children Museum in, um, you know, Minneapolis until they had the resource to be able to, you know, to branch off. So we're hoping that with y'all support and we still need sponsorships and everything, I had to put that out there to be able to do it, but to be able to have a permanent home, um, you know, to really have a black uh, museum be very nice uh, within our community. So you are, Nicole and, and Pastor Andre, you're in a space um, with folks who are from nonprofit organizations, um, public entities, right? Private um, kind of organizations. And as we're about to kind of end the session, just thinking through what would be one or two things that you would um, share or kind of ask each person to do as a result of having time to curate this exhibit. I'll let you go first, Nicole. Oh man, um, so many things. I think I, I said I am. I'm always learning and sort of humbled by um, all the work that continues to be done in this community. I, I do. Again, I'm a New Yorker, and I actually love Rochester and have had the pleasure of being able to build a life here. And so I think. Um, and that comes with its own sort of my own privileges around how I've been able to do that. But I also think that um, for all of the entities and the individuals that are on this call, really just continue. And this sounds so basic, but it's how I live my life. And it's really about being critical and being able to just ask the questions um, to sort of notice. I'm always sort of asking who is not at the table? Who is making the table? Why is this table here and not over there? Like these types of questions. Um, and of course, that's the proverbial table I'm talking about. But I think um, there's, there's, there is that. I think that is a good place to start. Certainly not the most eloquent thing I could say, but I think that's what comes to mind. I think that's how I ended up working on this exhibit was just, let's ask some more questions. Let's ask, there's more here. There's, let's, let's keep asking. Let's keep digging, you know, and and here we are, right? Um, it's something I've been committed to since I arrived here and found this small town in Rochester, you know, in Minnesota that is in a sense, becoming something else. It's it's growing and it's dynamic and it's malleable and people are really committed um, to, to doing that work together um, and have different visions for it, of course, but there is some energy here that I think is very different than some other places. And I think tapping into that, but always with that sort of critical mindset around asking those very difficult questions and then being able to also um, fashion and collaborate around what the answer and the response to that might be is important. And I think Kim is here um, sending some things about the oral histories. Thank you for that. Yes, I'll go ahead and, and unmute. I am very proud that the library has uh, an oral history um, from Joyce Gibbs. I think uh, knowing that it was recorded, um, there are some of the harder things that may not be fully included um, in the stories that she told me. Uh, but it's a really a nice snapshot in time. Um, from some of her experiences, and we do have that. And Nicole, I just wanted to clarify, I thought I had heard that the exhibit was going to be at the library. Is is that true or not true? Um, I think, yeah, the library did express interest. I think we just haven't connected. So we're happy. Kim, ah, to, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, we said yes. I think we just need to, yeah, get some next steps going on. So happy to have to, well, happy to do that. Well, Catherine's the one to schedule the space, and I'm the one to schedule a presentation with you and Andre, and I'd love to have you come and, and talk about it. Um, and maybe we can invite some um, members from the community as well. Okay, any last thoughts um, or reflections from anyone in this group? Andre, you're unmuted. I'm, a, I'm unmuted, yeah. I just wanna thank John and Jennifer and all, all you all for, um, Make a spaces, I think, um, 
for not individuals like me, black owners and black, um, you know, nonprofits. I just think that we have so much potential, um, you know, in this in this community. So I think if we lock arms together, we can do some uh, um, amazing, amazing things. So continue to get the word out. Is exhibit out here. We want to do presentations. We want to, you know, said so we won't repeat the repeat the past, right? So we can now say, okay, now we seem to pass the like. Now let's see, let's let's have, let's shape our our future. I know Mayo have this big bold initiative, right? This big bold bold initiative that everybody's now the city, the county, and everybody, you know, they're gonna spend billions of dollars, you know, in the next couple of years in our city. And so we want to want to say, okay. Uh, we want to be a part of that, right? We want to be a part of what DMC and stuff is doing. So let's continue to be intentional, uh, continue to invite us in those particular spaces. And so we can show individuals when they come all over to come to Mayo Clinic, what, what diversity truly uh, represent and what it look like. And Jennifer, I saw you hop on with your video. Did you have any last minute thought or comment on here? No? Okay. No, I just would say, please, if you have a chance, if you haven't seen the exhibit, um, it's upstairs right now um, on our second floor. Our building is open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Stop by anytime. If you'd like to see the exhibit and you can't come between 8 and 5, please let us know. We'll find another time. Otherwise, as uh, Pastor Crockett and Nicole said it will be other other places and locations, but it is incredibly powerful. And um, it, what's nice here is that when you're upstairs looking at it, you might be the only one up there and you can really take your time. And I know it, that was really important for me to be able to just have that time to sit. Um, and there's a couple of panels, one of which was really about uh, the Green Book and the Avalon and myself sitting with my own discomfort about how many times I've driven past the Avalon and not thought about it in the proper context. Um, and so um, we would love um, to have anybody who's interested uh, join us. Well, thank you for that reflection, Jennifer. Um, and obviously, Nicole and um, Pastor Andre, really grateful for your time. I know this is just an hour of your time, but this exhibit um, I know you shared reflect over six months um, and some of the information years of work. So grateful to the two of you, but also to others who have taken the time um, to put this information together. Um, and it's hard for me to live this without always pulling out like an old African saying. Um, so what I always say, you know, um, history is in the past. Um, we acknowledge it, but we also remember um, that it is what we leave going forward for those that come after us. And so what kind of community are we wanting to, to live for those that are coming after? So really appreciative. Um, and Al is making me pause here, so I'll pause for a moment. Just one question about, I'm hearing from Jennifer that there are panels that for the, ex, for the exhibit. What are there specific times or those panels are available? Not discussion panels, the actual physical panels. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so the actual, um, there's 14 uh, very wonderfully curated um, exhibit or, or part panels that are part of the exhibit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so leave you with that. We're being um, kind of cognizant of time, but reminding you that our next session or our next webinar series is going to be on March 13th. Join us then, it will be Women's History Month, um, very relevant and pertinent information about um, some of the work that is going on in that area and how it impacts some of the spaces that you're in and decisions that you can make in your own organization, but really as a community. So with that, I obviously end this session, but with gratitude, but with a call to action um, in all of the spaces that you go to. Thank you and have a great week. Thank you.